archive outside of the body. Uh, and so they frequently get better on their own. You have limited treatment. Examples of our viruses are going to be that common cold that is now arising in the fall winter season. Influenza, once again, is seasonal dependent. Measles, hepatitis B is a virus. Chickenpox is a virus. There are very few medications that will treat viruses. The next one being bacteria. These bacteria microorganisms can survive in or out of the body. Most common known ones are staph, streptococcus, salmonella, and shigella. These are very common uh, in, uh, infectious uh, organisms and uh, can be treated with antibiotics. A fungus is another type of microorganism that get their nutrition from other living organisms or dead organic matter. Our examples are thrush, ringworm, yeast, diaper rash uh, within the environment itself. You can have your mold, your mildew, and other spores and yeast. And uh, based on where it's located, especially if it's on the surface of the body, it can be treated with cream, creams or oral medication. Parasites, they live on or in another living organism. The ones that we know are the mites, the scabies mites, the pinworms, giardia, the lice, the tapeworms. And many times they need to be treated with antiparasitic medications. And sometimes they typically can cause diarrhea. Now we're looking at, in our world, in the clinical world, how is it translated and expressed when we have these symptoms of infectious diseases or conditions? So we have respiratory symptoms, upper and lower, can be causing cough, the presence of a runny nose and or nasal congestion, difficult or noisy breathing. We have GI symptoms that encompass diarrhea, vomiting, nausea, or stomach ache. We have skin symptoms. We have the rashes that present to us the itching. And uh, we have uh, constitutional symptoms such as fever, aches, and behavior changes. And then we have other smaller categories of symptoms where we have eyes that, or other infected body parts that could produce drainage or irritation. And then we have oral such as in our mouth sores and we may have the presence of swollen glands. As you can see, I talked about the respiratory upper and lower um, symptoms, and in this pie chart that's taken from our Managing Infectious Diseases in Child Care and School, uh, respiratory presence co compasses 66% of our symptoms followed by fever at 14%. And the third most common that you will see in your facility, and I'm sure you're going through your mind saying, hmm, yeah, I see that compares to what's happening with me if something does um, occur, that the third most common are our GI symptoms with vomiting and diarrhea. Now we want to look at symptoms versus disease. So we as caregivers, teachers, uh, health care providers um, in the early childhood centers often worry about making a diagnosis. But remember, children develop symptoms first but don't have a diagnosis. And in the field, you do not need to make the diagnosis of a specific disease. What you do need to do is recognize the symptoms for which the exclusion is necessary. And so understanding as we roll through this webinar that exclusion uh, is for each symptom is not always necessary. So, For example, a child can be excluded due to a rash with no behavioral changes. And a rash is a symptom, but it's not a diagnosis is not a condition. And if the child activity level has not been negatively affected, the rash does not represent anything harmful to the child or others. But uh, because we are worried that the child is contagious or harmful to others, 
then without evidence-based decision-making, um, we may make diagnoses that are, may not be accurate. So basing on the symptoms of the illness, um, it will guide you to whether there's a reason to exclude or not exclude. My role is to highlight um, the first part where it's an immediate reflex reaction. So if on arrival and your child in your facility um, has been accepted after their daily health check and these symptoms develop suddenly, these symptoms of severe illness, it doesn't matter what the diagnosis is, call the EMS, call the ambulance, call 911 and notify the parents. So multiple children that suddenly become affected by an injury or an illness at the same time, not just one isolated case or an isolated child, this would cause concern. Any child that has skin or lips that look blue, purple, or gray, any kind of abnormal rhythmic jerking of arms and legs, yes, that may indicate seizure activity. Vomiting large amounts of blood, large volume of blood in stools, and a stiff neck that develops in that child with a headache and the presence of fever, and then most immediately and emergently, a suddenly spreading purple or red rash. The list is long because fever with difficulty breathing or abnormal skin color, the child suddenly becomes very pale, blue, or very pink, that's a reflex to call 911. A sudden acute change in the child acting strangely, becoming less alert or withdrawn, even more lethargic, to the point of unresponsiveness or unconsciousness, reflex reaction, that's a 911. A head injury could be an accidental head injury witnessed with the following decrease in level of alertness, confusion, um, headache, immediate onset of vomiting, difficulty walking, irritability, that is an immediate need for EMS. Difficulty breathing, the child is unable to speak, or increasing complaints of severe pain or increasing pain anywhere. The child becomes, uh, well, develops signs of dehydration um, because hopefully on the health, daily health check, you will have had um, uh, a first glance at the child, but the child stops drinking. There's no urination for many hours in the day. Uh, there are no tears, the child's activity level decreases, the child's eyes appear sunken. Then that is cause for a 911 call. And lastly, a cut or burn that is large or deep and will not stop bleeding. The second criteria of urgency, these are urgent conditions that may not need immediate EMS reflex, um, but will need medical care within, uh, within at least an hour or so as, and parent notification. So these conditions don't need an ambulance as long as a parent can pick the child up within the hour. And we're covering a lot of severe conditions. This, this category is urgent conditions. And um, I think that all of us would recognize these conditions that would need urgent evaluation by a healthcare professional. So we have broken it down into fever above 101 in a child older than two months who looks more than mildly ill. Fever above 100.4 in a child younger than two months. So we have a separated category by age. Unexplained irritability, severe vomiting and or diarrhea, animal bite that now breaks the skin, venomous bites or sting, injury like a break to the skin that now may require stitches. So I recognize that level of awareness is being called on. For example, in venomous bites or stings, um, in areas where it is known that a venomous bite can pose a severe risk, then that requires an actual 911 call. But 
understanding that even I myself may not know in my own specific area what category this venomous bite would fall under, whether it's severe risk or urgent, then uh, following uh, a procedure protocol of just checking in with 911 or poison control will help guide you. Many of us have to use a lot of references, even healthcare professionals. Next level of category of symptoms requiring exclusion. Fever that develops with a behavior change. Diarrhea, blood in the stool, vomiting more than two times in 24 hours. The child is in your care, probably no more than eight to 10 hours. So if you do see vomiting more than two times within that, that period, then that is considered in this category of um, calling the parent and having the child excluded. Uh, there are some cases of abdominal pain and drooling with mouth sores. Some of these symptoms will require a visit to a healthcare professional, but not all. These conditions are less severe than the first two categories, but they do re require exclusion despite the lack of a diagnosis. And looking up and using your tools um, through looking up the symptoms in managing infectious diseases in child care in schools or caring for our children, or knowing your local health care um, center, um, or having a health care consultant professional. So with that, uh, going through that fever by itself is not an exclusion category if the child is exhibiting normal behavior, because fever is just a representation of an elevation of the normal body temperature. So a child that may have had his immunization, his or her, then um, and comes the next day, but it's acting fine and still has the elevation of a temperature above 101 for a child that is over two months of age, then um, that is not a criteria for exclusion. Fever can be caused by signs of illnesses, such as rheumatoid arthritis or cancer, can be a reaction to a variety of medicines. So with that, any child or infant, I should say, younger than two months with fever does fall into the criteria of getting medical attention immediately. Um, the fever by itself is not harmful, but we really want to have that level of awareness that there may be the presence of an illness causing his, him or her to, uh, to have a serious illness in this particular age group. Uh, the blood in the stool, if you've seen um, hard stools, because you are changing, um, and there is um, light blood, uh, and this is called constipation, passage of hard stools, so that may not require exclusion. But blood in the stool not related to passive, passage of hard stools, yes, that is a symptom requiring exclusion. Um, also, to go back again into vomiting, if you already have a care plan for a child with a medical diagnosis of GI reflux, well, you already know if this is small spit-ups or some spit-ups from pre-diagnoses, uh, pre then these children do not need to be excluded, and they should have a special care plan within their file. Now, any abdominal pain, so in that some cases, that continues for more than two hours, or intermittent abdominal pain now with the presence of fever or other signs or symptoms of behavior change, then that child falls into immediate uh, call for exclusion. Drooling with mouth sores pretty much stands by it is by itself. Acknowledging that this list is long, everyone, and by referring to the symptom chart, once again, in managing infectious diseases in child care and schools, um, it also addresses when children with these symptoms can return to care, which I am not addressing in this particular webinar today. So, um, my role is talking about the impact of infectious diseases, and uh, the whole scope of the webinar is looking at um, how can we provide you the tools and the awareness into looking at whether they're severe, they're urgent, um, needs immediate exclusion, 
or in the second half of this webinar, do they fall into a mildly ill and uh, category, and therefore the impact of infectious diseases that can hit our parents really hard, and the economic impact of it for the loss of revenue for our families, the loss of productivity for the employers, the, um, the disruption of other colleagues filling in for a missing parent at work, finding alternative caregivers, um, and then making that um, connection with the, con the contagiousness of the symptoms that are presenting to you when to send the children home sick so that uh, it will not lead to the kids being send sent home unnecessarily. There was a New York Times article that was created on September 16, 2019. I read it. It's a little harsh on our um, daycare and early childhood centers, but some of the take-home messages are, and that what we are promoting today is that using evidence-based decision-making, using evidence-based tools, you can take control, change thought processes, change culture, change thought processes within your own facility with on your own business, as well as sharing that across on your first contract with your parents um, so that um, we can try to reverse what has been laid and can uh, affect us in so many ways that are, that are negative in that way. So with that, there's a domino effect. The child appears ill. We're hoping that you'll use your evidence-based decision-making skills that are presented today and can be uh, fleshed out even more through your tools and resource kits that you as an early education center um, will want to, through your daily health check, and ensure that the child is okay, that the child can stay, or the child needs to be excluded in that way. Uh, by using um, universal precautions and looking at um, the thought processes that children are often infectious before they show any signs and symptoms, um, we can change our current practices to help everyone. Good news, bad news. So because our children are coming to us, they're being first exposure to many mild illnesses, they seem sicker more often, and you're going to acknowledge and validate that with your parents. Um, but you're also going to discuss, have awareness, that incidence of illnesses decrease as the child ages because their immunity increases as they build their own protective antibodies. So these children are developing their immune system in a very healthy way, and that exclusion is unlikely to reduce the spread of disease. So. Um, with that, I am going to turn that over to my counterpart as to continuing this discussion as more detail enrolls as to whether to exclude or more inclusive to change culture. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Uh, next. We're excited to introduce our second speaker, Katie Maladano, uh, who will discuss how you can develop inclusion exclusion policies for infectious disease and how to care for children who are kind of sick but don't meet the exclusion criteria. Katie is a pediatric RN and is a passionate about community health to improve the wellness of children and families across Colorado. In addition to serving Healthy Child Care Colorado as a nurse coordinator, she's a school nurse consultant with Children's Hospital Colorado, caring for a large Denver Metro School District, several community centers, preschools, and school-aged camps. Katie's recent professional contributions include work with the National Resource Center as a subject matter expert to provide national level training modules for child care health consultants and work with HCCC in the creation of required state level trainings for both CCHCs and licensed center staff. In addition to online learning contributions, Katie has partnered with HCCC to update statewide competencies for CCHCs, create a peer mentor 
program for CCHCs in Colorado and launch a monthly opportunity for CCHCs across Colorado to connect by video through state huddles. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Katie, for that introduction. And I hope everyone can hear me okay. I'm gonna go ahead and continue. Um, oh. And I think the slide advanced. Is anyone? Um, there we go. Okay. Okay. Okay, um, and so we're going to begin with the overview of tools to control infection. Um, we have things listed here that are very basic, but as a nurse um, discussing this today, we do want to talk about the things that are prevention focused. And so we know that nutrition, sleep, and immunizations are very key in helping us to keep healthy ourselves and also helping the kids to stay healthy. Uh, we want to encourage our parents to be sure their children are eating well, they're getting adequate sleep um, to support their stronger immune systems. So we want to see this modeled not only in our children in their daily routine with our centers, but also with staff doing these things, um, eating good meals and, and having good snacks during their day too, as far as modeling behaviors and also encouraging our parents to be doing that at home. It is important in the Early Childhood Education Center um, that we do model and support this and how it interacts with the parents. Number one, of course, with the overview of tools to control infection is going to be washing our hands. Most important thing at all times is washing our hands and encouraging our, our children and our students to do the same. Um, we do reduce the number of disease causing germs from entering the body by focusing on that as our primary defense. Cleaning and sanitizing surfaces according to how we are supposed to be doing that for food surfaces and other surfaces. Following our standard precautions for exposure to blood, um, which does happen at times in this age range because we do have accidents and owies. Um, of course, disposing of materials that might contain bad germs. We think about our tissues, we think about um, different things that the students and the children might be using that could contain germs. And then excluding ill people from the group when it matters. And we're gonna talk more about that. As far as a, a hot topic here for you guys to use as a take home, daily health checks are extremely important. Um, it's the involvement of that routine of greeting parents and children every day. It's a communication. I'm gonna go into a little bit more detail on how this might be done, um, but it does give the caregiver the ability to identify illnesses while the parents are still present. We all know how difficult it can be to get in touch with parents at times once they're gone and into their work day and out and about in the community. Um, with the daily health check topic, we want to know when is this performed? We do want to see it performed each day during drop off, not after the parents have left. And so as far as forming an idea in your mind of what this picture might look like, why we might do it, we want to be able to detect those conditions that might need exclusion. Um, we want to consider the sick season coming up with all our snotty noses and different illnesses that are starting to, to spread around and what we might be seeing. Who does the health check? Well, it would be a good idea to have a designated person. So it could be the person that's accepting the kiddos in and having the parents sign them in every day. That could be a very good person to do it. But think about your program specifically and how this might flow. What this doesn't um, intend to do is to add a difficult extra task onto your day. Instead, it's going to create this understanding of what each student's baseline might be so that it'll be instantly observable. To
forgive my pauses while I'm trying to get these to. <laughs> Having some troubles, ladies, with getting my slides to oh. okay. And so what to do when kids get sick after daily health checks? And well, I apologize for that pause. And so the big picture here is the participation in activities. And if you have staff being pooled for that additional care, that is a very obvious and very important um, thing. We know ratios can be tight at times. And if you do have students and children who are unable to participate in activities with the rest of the kiddos, um, it's definitely a moment to pause and consider what steps need to be taken next. Um, the checking for other symptoms, of course, is important and having something in place where you know you're going to have them rest on the side, maybe check a temperature, um, maybe go through a list of questions with the child to see how they're feeling and if there are any other symptoms present. With the uh, symptoms that might be very apparent, especially for those that are younger, of course, looking for them to be less active, maybe withdrawn, clingy or cranky, and not participating, of course, in whatever the other children are doing. If it does look like these symptoms are developing while they're in your care, do notify the parent or guardian right away. Um, you should have something in place that is policy related, and we'll talk about that in a moment because policy is your friend. Um, but please do take a second also to pause and consider all of the conditions and symptoms that Dr. Chin covered as severe illnesses requiring 911 to be called and the parents, of course, to be contacted. What we're talking about here are things that might develop that aren't that urgent or acute, but maybe definitely would require care outside of your program still. Okay, thank you. For exclusion, questions that come up. How do you make decisions about exclusion and what are the characteristics of a good exclusion criteria? Well, each early childhood education center is encouraged to address these items with the child care health consultant or their CCRNR to be sure the policies they establish for exclusion and inclusion meet their state licensing criteria. This is important in this platform as I know that what we follow here in Colorado could be very different from what we have in our neighboring states. So it's important to follow what your state licensing criteria uh, states. Make this information available in written form. Share it with your staff and with all the parents at the time of enrollment as requested. And um, this can definitely ensure the decision making um, goes smoothly whenever you do feel like you need to exclude a child. If this is materials that parents are reviewing before their children even enter your program, um, it is going to be a lot easier to bring this up when the time does come for their child to go home. So make sure your parent handbook um, and your policies and procedures are all up to date and read and reviewed by staff and parents. Is exclusion an effective way to reduce transmission of germs? No, and as Dr. Chen re also relayed, it's it's very likely that germs have already been spread and that other students and staff members have been exposed to some germs. What are the reasons to exclude children from an out of child, um, out of home child care? We are going to address some of these things on the next slides, but um, please do consider a couple more things as you're um, thinking about the policy that you're going to have for your program, parent handbook, what you're going to review with your staff and parents. Make sure you do encourage all families to have a backup plan for child care. Um, with the illnesses that do come up, making sure that you are also aware and have a plan around those students who already have pre-existing health conditions because it could be very likely that you also are addressing things around that. So just make sure that you have all these things in place 
prior to them coming up and you're suddenly in a situation where you kind of wish you had them in place already and established. As far as reasons for exclusion, I do apologize for, it looks like I have a delay on my end with the changing of the slides. Um, oh, let me go back one. Reasons for exclusion, the parent and the teacher should exclude if any of the following are true. So we're looking at that big picture perspective. The child is unable to participate comfortably in activities. This is huge. The child requires more personal care than that may compromise the health and safety of the other children. Again, thinking about those ratios of staff to kids and, and if staff are being pulled and posing a risk of spread of harmful disease to others. Okay, so if any of these are true, the child may be sent home or excluded from care. And remember that policy is our friend. It's important to have these things written in policy. What about fever? In the case of fever, um, which often comes up for centers, please recall the information from the Caring for Our Children online database. That's an important resource that, that can be very useful to you. Um, what it says about fever, it's an indication of the body's response to something, but is neither a disease nor a serious problem by itself. That's very important. Again, something Dr. Chen did speak to as well. Fever by itself, not as, um, as much of the picture as the other symptoms might be present. So if they're behaving normally and they have a fever, they should be monitored, but they do not need to be excluded for fever alone. So you would watch them for further symptoms to develop. However, please do consider the other indicators such as age, the level of the fever and other contributing factors. Refer to your local healthcare consultant or your CCRNR for your state requirement regarding the fever. Resources are always important. Um, do not wing it when it comes to determining whether a child should be in your care or not. Definitely always refer back to a solid resource such as the Caring for Your Children or um, our excellent resource with the managing infectious diseases in schools and child cares. Our goal of exclusion. It is not usually to reduce the spread of mild infections and symptoms often occur um, after germs have already been spread. So we already addressed that. Uh, many others have likely been exposed um, in the classroom and, and in the um, program setting. And so as far as ensuring children who cannot participate or need more care than possible are at home and ensuring children have adequate supervision and teacher caregiver to child ratios are maintained, we want to make sure that the focus is on the child's activity level to ensure that the proper ratio is in place and that the most comfortable environment possible is provided for the child. Um, that very likely could be at home if they're having a difficult time, okay? Um, there are a number of conditions that are serious, as that last bullet point says, and that list is long, um, but they occur uncommonly. And so we vaccinate for many of these conditions. We want you guys to be aware of that resource still, Managing Infectious Diseases and Child Care in Schools. Um, that provides those conditions um, where the children could be um, automatically excluded, in addition to those urgent type symptoms, Dr. Chicago. How to care for sick kids that don't meet exclusion criteria or kind of sick kids. This is a very hot topic because you do not um, always have that clear cut and dry black and white. This kid can stay. This kid needs to go home. And so we consider this question and we want to walk through it a little bit. Excluding children with mild illnesses is unlikely to reduce the spread of most infectious agents caused by bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungi. And those were covered previously. So most infections spread by children um, are spread when they do not have symptoms yet. Uh, exposure to frequent mild infections do, does help the child's immune system develop in a healthy way. That's an, important to consider as well. 
As a child gets older, they develop immunity to common infectious agents and will become ill less often. Sometimes you see those students who come in to childcare, daycare settings for the first time ever, and it seems like they're just continuously sick as their immune system is kind of catching up and getting stronger, getting exposed to things for the first time. We've all seen that. Some diseases um, have other criteria for child return. Um, for example, a child diagnosed with strep throat, and this is referring back to our excellent resources on how to handle the illnesses and the expectations for return. But a child diagnosed with strep throat um, or strep skin infection should not return to school or childcare until at least 12 hours after beginning the appropriate antibiotic um, and they are able to participate. So that's kind of a, an example of a very special scenario on whenever the kids should be excluded and when they should return. Coming back up to our bullet points here, the most important reason for exclusion is the inability of the child to participate in activities and the staff to care for the child. We keep kind of driving this home and, and kind of repeating it in different ways, but it really is that big picture view um, plus the ratios. Uh, the child's age, the child's surroundings, the potential risk to others, and the type and severity of symptoms all should be considered and looking at that big picture. Okay. Decisions about providing care that is comfortable for the child while awaiting the parent to pick up should be made on a case-to-case -case basis. Um, so should they kind of go off to the side and you can still have them in ratio, but maybe they're resting with their head down, or maybe their symptoms seem like they are um, exposing children's, uh, other children, and they should be removed from the classroom. So just just kind of think about those things as you go into that case by case basis. How to care for kids can continue that don't meet that exclusion criteria. And so you'll see that children attending childcare frequently carry contagious organisms that do not limit their activity or pose a threat to their contacts. We do expect this to be normal, kind of the baseline that they're going to be carrying these different little um, illnesses here and there um, throughout their time in your program. And it's not necessarily something um, to, to not expect. Expect that they're going to have their snotty noses and, and little illnesses here and there. Um, what is the most important thing as far as our uh, protection from these things being spread? the prevention of transmission of these organisms, of course, hand and personal hygiene. So we look at our daily routine for these students. We look at the daily routine, not only for them, but also for our staff members and reinforcing the good practice of, of hand hygiene, um, modeling, um, even asking parents if they um, are there to model the same behavior so that we can prevent at least a little bit some of that spread. So we do have listed here kind of the flip side of what Dr. Chen had covered earlier. We do have conditions we want to put on the screen for you to look at that do not necessarily mean automatic exclusion. The reason why we have these up because some of these conditions, as you'll see, people might see or they might hear and they say, okay, this, this child needs to go home. So we don't, we don't automatically go there because we're going to follow best practices. We're going to be following our excellent resources and um, deciding whether or not they should stay or go home. And of course, that um, daily health check in the big picture is going to help tremendously in deciding if the child should be with us or if they should be resting at home with supervision of their parents, okay? And so when looking down this list, we'll cover some of the most common things, but we also want to pull out an, a few notes about some of these things. Um, for example, MRSA, without an infection or illness that would otherwise require an exclusion, um, is it necessarily a reason for them to go home? The CMV infection can sometimes be concerning for people because of the exposure um, to pregnant women. Um, so pregnant caregivers and teachers and pregnant mothers of children um, should carefully wash their hands, reduce the risk of this infection and infection from other viruses that could harm a fetus. And so that's one to pull out 
the biggest thing about these conditions that we might think, oh, what about the exposure to somebody who is pregnant, maybe my staff member, it is important for them to know they can always call their own healthcare professional um, with these questions to get further guidance, okay? Um, and you see the list of some of these other things on here as well. Several of them are, are bloodborne type of conditions and aren't things that we would exclude students for, okay? So we do want to pull out and note some of these things are end of day exclusions. So we have ringworm, um, head lice, impetigo, scabies. These are also some of those words that you think, oh my goodness, I do not want myself, my staff, other children exposed to this. However, there are ways that these are addressed and approached in that um, whole criteria um, for supporting the family and treating their children and also on um, what we can be aware of on our side. Ringworm, it's one of those things um, we do expect end of day that they would have the appropriate care done after they go home from the program as far as medication treatment and that they could return the following day. Head lice, the same thing. It is very likely that once you do notice head lice, that others have already been exposed and that it's been um, a part of what that child has been bringing in um, prior to you even being aware. And so it's important to reinforce that treatment is needed and required prior to returning the next day. Impetigo, one of those conditions where treatment can happen after they go home from the program. Um, I know for Colorado specifically, our resources point out 24 hours of antibiotic treatment prior to returning. I would encourage you to look up each of these here and make sure that you're following in line with your own state resources and local resources as far as infectious diseases go. I think a couple of these. Um, as far as the summary, you see the most important thing in all of this um, is that you have something written in writing, reviewed with staff, with parents. Um, rules are confusing. They do vary. Um, know what your resources are on that local and state guideline level. Um, know your resources. The new fifth edi edition of the Managing Infectious Disease is a great resource and you can easily um, tap into that and see what the um, verbiage is so you can add it to your parent handbooks and your staff resources as well. Um, with the exclusion criteria, we do realize and we know and understand that many times whenever you do have to exclude a student, um, call a parent up, it can be an emotional thing. It can be controversial and it can be confusing. The parent could have a different idea in their head as far as what they feel like is appropriate for their child to be in your program versus what you might have written in your policy and procedures. And so um, that's the importance of having them review and sign ahead of time that they do understand. We do have three main reasons for exclusion. And we've gone over these, but we wanna drive them home. If whatever they're experiencing prevents them from participating comfortably in activities, this is huge. If it results in a need for care that is greater than the staff can provide without compromising the health and safety of the other children, um, of course, a huge, huge ingredient there. We don't want to um, pull whenever safety and ratios is required for the program. And then also considering the health and safety of the other children, if it is something that could put them at risk. And then specific symptoms or conditions. And so we want to think back on what we just covered, but also those urgent type of symptoms Dr. Chen covered earlier. And then we do need to make a decision about who to notify um, we um, do have local public health authorities that are available to us. I know myself and my practice, you heard my, my list of things that I have my hands in between schools and child cares and camps. And I often rely on my local public health authority to help me make decisions at times whenever it does feel like I have something that could be putting other children at risk or, um, or at this very special scenario where we have to consider the safety of other young ones and um, all of that good stuff with this special setting. And so that is it for me. 
I appreciate you listening in. All right, thank you so much, Katie and Dr. Chen. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions now. So folks have been writing questions in the chat box as we've gone along, and I'm just going to read off some of them. And let's see, um, one of the questions that we got from Sarah Johnson is, what do you do if a parent can't pick, uh, pick a kid up within an hour and they have severe diarrhea or vomiting? I'll leave that up to. So that would be a part of um, uh, policy and procedure in placing the child in an area that is um, should be made on a case by case basis. That the child should be separated according to policy um, at least three feet um, from the others to help minimize exposure of staff and children who were not previously in close contact with the with the child. Then all who have been in contact with the ill child should wash their hands, plus all toys, equipment, and surfaces used by the ill child should be cleaned and disinfected after the child leaves. So it's going to be based on a case-by-case -case basis, considering the factor of the child's age, the surroundings, potential risk to others um, that um, uh, Katie may have mentioned, and, and with the diarrhea. So the child should be supervised by someone who knows the child well, and will continue to observe the child um, in a safe in a safe safe space, I should say, but at least three feet from other separation until that parent arrives. Great, thank you. Um, another question we got is from Teresa Stenserson, um, and I think this is a really important one. So she mentions that some states. Uh, Child care rules require exclusion for things that do not need exclusion, as outlined here. So I was wondering, uh, Katie, if you could answer that question about how to address that. Yes, I'd love to clarify. And so are there specific health conditions, Teresa, that you're referring to as far as how to support those? or? Um, I think I've seen this question before, so hopefully I can help address this. Uh, let's see. It, she responded that I think you covered that state's very. Um, yeah, I think it, it has to do with we've got the CFOC Caring for Our Children Best Practices that we've kind of been going over and the managing infectious diseases, but uh, some state licensing is different. So how do they deal with, you know, best practices versus licensing requirements? Okay. Yeah. And so that is an excellent question because um, although we do have these great national resources, it is important to consider first your local and state um, guidelines and the rules, all of that, um, and then start from there. And so you can use it the opposite way, start with the rules from local and then build it out um, with support from these different resources like the Caring for Our Children is an excellent resource. And so it is important to follow your, your state and local first. I don't know if that answer is appropriately, Teresa, feel free to further clarify if that is not it. <laughs> nope, she said thanks. So it looks like you got it. Um, Let's see, another question we got was from Gina. Um, says, uh, could you provide more clarification on diarrhea? How many times within a time frame requires exclusion? Okay, so I'm gonna read this. Um, diarrhea is defined by stools that are more frequent or less form than usual for that child and not associated with changes in diet or I gave the example of the constipation where you actually see a firm, firm stool or a hard ball. So exclusion is required for all diaper children whose stool is not contained in the diaper and toilet trained children if the diarrhea is causing those quote unquote accidents outside of their underwear. In addition, diaper children with diarrhea should be excluded if stool frequency exceeds two stools 
more than they're typical. So um, sometimes um, our centers um, do document how many how many stools per day um, for that particular child during the time in the program day. Um, uh, and because this may cause too much work for the caregivers or teachers, and then most definitely if the stools are containing that real blood or mucus. Readmission after diarrhea can occur when the diaper children have their stool contained by the diaper, even if the stools may remain a little loose, but it's contained, and when toilet trained children are not having accidents. And um, to follow up on the um, number of stools, when stool frequency is no more than two stools more than typical for that child um, during the time in the program day. I hope that helps. Yes, uh, great, thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, we have to stop the question uh, and answer session right now, um, as it is 1.30. Um, but thank you both for this wonderful insight. Um, and I wanted to let everybody know that there will be follow-up emails, as we've been saying throughout. So if your question didn't get answered, um, you'll have the opportunity to get it answered with that follow-up. Also, um, as a reminder, you're, everybody who's been registered to attend this and ha has attended the event will uh, get an email with a link on how to get your nursing credits. So please be sure to respond and complete that evaluation by November 5th in order to get the nursing credits. Thank you again for participating and a special Thanks to our speakers. I hope you all have a great afternoon.